When I started in this band, I was a kid. Everything about being a kid is hard. You know, life is kind of torture when you're a kid. And the band is the thing that saves you from that torture. So it becomes your cocoon, it becomes the place where you grew up, it becomes the thing that helped you mold your identity. And in some ways, it's the thing that gave you your identity. It's the thing that you got really good at and helped you feel good about yourself. Ah, the ending. The beginning, there's so much hope, and it's a clean slate, and you just go for it. The ending never feels like it's the right time to end. And for all the reasons that I'd like it to be over, which are almost exclusively physical things, in my heart, and in my mind, I'm not ready. We haven't really known another life. I don't think there is a, a really a, an end. I have no fear of the future, no regret, uh, to, to the contrary. This is, to me, a fantastic the thing we've done, and I feel great that uh, I was able to sustain my prime for a long, long time and keep improving to the level that I wanted to get to. To go out on the top and not face the diminishing of your abilities, that's what I couldn't face. If all that is true, then you'd have to say that ending is harder than beginning, because the beginning is a place you've escaped to that's been a warm and nurturing environment for over 40 years. And walking away from that is not so fun. super nerdy like that. We, we've always been over rehearsers. <laughs> the songs are complicated and um, if we don't get to the point where you can do it without thinking, uh, then it's not good because then if something happens during a show or something goes wrong, you can just deal with it much more easily if it's ingrained. So have you reached muscle memory yet? On some songs, yeah, I have. On some songs, I'm still finding my place. <laughs> Stuff we haven't played since the 70s is a little tricky. <laughs> songs that you've played, even though you haven't played them in 10 years, it's quite incredible, actually, that after not playing them for that long, it's in there somewhere. It's right. like stored in somewhere in your... Just accessing it. Yeah. And now it's faulty. It doesn't come back, you know, it's like a digital copy that comes back incorrect, but mostly there. <laughs> That's what it's like. We'd like to go back into our past a bit, to our first couple of albums. Now that everybody's feeling in the mood, are, are you in the mood? Well, this is called Fly By Night. Rush have built their reputation the hard way on the road, 
Their strange flavor and singular sound ignited a deep connection with their fans unlike anything else in modern music. Rush never stopped recording, never stopped touring, and have been together as a solitary unit for four decades. They are the last of their generation, the end of an era. Big rock shows in the 70s seemed like a, a very different thing than now. It was what kids did in the 70s. Rock was the language of, the, of youth. Tickets were like seven bucks. It was as much the culture of youth as, as you know, an EDM festival is now, or even maybe even more so, because I think it was more universal. There'd be a million arena tours that you could get an opening slot on. If you were willing to be a lunatic and, and play 250 nights a year and, and live under really lousy conditions, most people couldn't stand sleeping in vans and doubling up in motel rooms night after night after night. That's a tough life. You know, I think people glamorize it, but it's a really hard life. Thank you. We haven't got a lot of time tonight, but we'd like to do something from our last album. This is called 2112. You know, we played every day, basically. And we traveled usually three to 400 miles a night. Transportation was a big deal. When we started out, we had a rental car. So there were four of us in the rental car, the three of us and Howard, our road manager. We were doing 200 cities a year, pretty grueling schedule. Like six nights a week, seven nights a week, 50 weeks a year. There were lots of bars, there was lots of high schools, there was lots of whatever. Basically sleeping with your head against the seat ahead of you. On occasion, Neil and, and Ged would drive, but mainly myself and Alex did a lot of the driving. And then we were promoted to a, a station wagon. It was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. Now I can sleep on the luggage in the back. And one of us would have a turn sleeping on the luggage in the back, and you felt like, oh, tonight's my night. I <laughs> get the luggage. We used to barter things, so who's going to drive, you know? I'll pay you $50 if you take my shift. And we did that for the first 10 years of, of touring. I remember being in Saskatchewan and Alex and I went out to a parking lot and we were staring at this, you know, this van that had a raised roof with a sleeper in it. It had this sort of upper deck bed. Now this was just a big van with a cap on it. Uh, a camper, basically, like a small family camper. Dodge Funcraft, it was called. It was with great longing that we wanted that vehicle. We were all so excited about this Funcraft. It was the most ridiculous thing. It was bright blue, and it had a roof on it. But we were younger. It didn't matter. We were just crazy, traveling around the country in this stupid family van, basically. There was something quite perverse about it. It was sp space. We could stick stuff up on the walls, and you know, I actually cooked in it. I think I made a, a, a tuna casserole. <laughs> they were so looking forward to taking off in their fun craft. I mean, the miles they put on in the beginning, I don't know how they did it. And they were working 50 weeks a year. It was insane. I remember one night, the guys in Thin Lizzy uh, challenged us to a drinking contest. So of course, we had it in the fun craft. We drank them under the table. But it's a little tiny table in the fun craft. You know, it's got these little happy curtains in it and this little kind of fake table. And I used to look and think, this is like families go on holiday in this little thing with the little kids. And here are these kind of 
subhuman musicians all sitting around <laughs> drinking bottles of Chivas Regal until they puke. <laughs> it's kind of a nice irony to that. We went through three motors. We put 500,000 miles on it, something like that. It was the ultimate camping trip, I call it. They eventually grew that they bought a much larger RV. The crew got the fun craft, and, which we thought was luxurious too, uh, and eventually developed into buses, but that, that all took years. We've always been very close, and uh, a lot of that is through our humor. We share a common sense of humor, and, and it makes things so much easier. You know, you really look forward to spending time together when it's like that. Alex is such a funny man. You do get hired. I do. <laughs> he would get dressed up on the Kiss Tour as this character called The Bag. It was almost like the unknown comic at the time. He used to crack the guys and kiss them. You know, and they all always, always wanted the bag. You know, Ace Frehley used to go, hey, are you going to have the bag tonight? <laughs> all right, bring the bag over here. <laughs> where's the bag? Howie, where's the bag? <laughs> the bag was just like, would pop up every once in a while. Not that often. It was just a face drawn on a big laundry bag. You know, they had these paper laundry bags in the beautiful Holiday Inns we used to stay in. And I would pull, you know, make two holes for eyes and draw a stupid face on it and wear sweatpants and stick my arms through the sweatpants so only my hands came out at the knee <laughs> and have the bag on. And the bag would talk like this. <laughs> and the bag was always drunk and really smart and knew everything and made a lot of, uh, you know, suggestions to people in the room. <laughs> and uh, running commentary for a couple hours. Usually the bag appeared in Ace Fraley's room. Yeah. Almost always in Ace Fraley's yes. room. And the bag would come over and entertain Ace. Because most everybody else would be very upset with the bag. Well, Gene would be upset. Gene was very, very upset with the bag. Yeah. And that made Ace even happier. Ah, baloney. <laughs> Gene was straight. He wasn't high like we were. So it had a, he had a different sense of reality when he came into Ace's room, you know? We were like drinking and smoking and generally being idiots. Uh, and Gene came in one time and there were these two girls that were looking at the bag, like wondering, who's that guy? Why has he got that thing on his head? So one of them went over and tried to remove it. Well, the bag went. Berserk. Well, when you try to remove the bag from the bag, that, that's cause for immediate ejection from the hotel room. So I threw them out. And Gene was very upset about that because that's the only reason he was in <laughs> yeah. the room was because there were two girls. And it was room. Ace's room. A life in music is very unpredictable. When Rush went out on tour in 2013, it seemed at first like simply another tile in the mosaic that is an artist's life. But neither the fans nor the band could have predicted this tour might mean so much more. I think that album is the album we always wanted to make since we first got together the lyrics and the drumming on there and the music that we created. Working with the string section is something we'd always talked about doing. The size of the story and the resolution of the story. So I was at that point where that tour and that album totally pleased me. And I never had that before. It was a huge accomplishment for us. We took a sabbatical after the Clockwork Angels tour. So all of us agreed we wouldn't even talk about work for a year. 
every tour we had done had been so successful that it was, okay, we'll go out next year and we'll do another 40 shows. We had, for the first time in five years, taken a year off. The sabbatical properly is a time to take on, uh, you know, other projects. And for me, I got into book writing and published my own book, Clockwork Angels, graphic novel. Worked on a sequel to it, Clockwork Lives, with Kevin Anderson. I felt the sense of completion and transition, and I thought, hmm, so we have to talk. Those, those fateful words, guys, we have to talk. I think he loves being a drummer of that caliber. But if you were to ask him, he'd say, it's too fucking hard. <laughs> and I think it's really very fucking hard for him to play at the level that he plays. Over a three-hour show, he's, he's pumping on an awful lot of energy. Um, it's it's got to be extremely physically demanding for him. Singing is the worst job, but drumming is the hardest job, you know? Where's the guitar playing video? Piece of cake, are you kidding me? You know, the blister on my little finger. No, I was singing just to stand up there in front of everyone. We both recognize, oh, you don't know what's coming. No, it's, it's by far the worst job singing, but drumming is by far the hardest job. He's an athlete. He's 63 years old, and he's playing a three-hour set, and he won't do it unless he can play up to his standards, which is basically, I have to be the world's greatest drummer. This is what has been bestowed on me. Uh, this is what I do. I'm not gonna let it slip. By the end of every tour, he's got numerous ailments and they keep shifting. His body doesn't respond very well. He gets through it and he does it and he's very proud and feels good and that's the kind of guy he is. But it's killing him. I accept the fact that things cannot stay as they've been. And I accept the fact that the enemy here is time. Go, go back a little further historically, they've all taken their turns where they're not so sure about touring anymore. You know, 30 years ago when they first, you know, started having kids and it became more challenging. More so lately, I'd, I'd say that uh, emphasis has fallen more on Neil's side. For a long time, he was tired of, of touring. He just didn't want to go on the road. He makes the best of it. He rides his motorcycle, and as we all find our things to keep us occupied. But for a long time, I don't think he really wanted to tour anymore. That is what it is. I mean, it's always taken a little bit more convincing to get him to go back on the road. So I, I think in a lot of ways, this has been brewing for quite a few years. By the first tour, I was already pretty much over the touring life as a life and started reading at the time and started writing. I went to a pawn shop in Little Rock, Arkansas, bought myself a typewriter, so I would write. It was 20 years before I published anything. But in the interim, I was learning how to do that, and it was a part of my life reading and writing long before drumming was. It, it was an evolving realization. It wasn't like at the end of Clockwork Angels tour, I said, I'm done. All is for the best, believe in what we're told. Like, you know what? I think that's about enough for this old body. That's the athlete that people forget. Yes, the creative artist is one thing, and certain drummers can play till they keel over. In eight years, I'll be 71. I could play Charlie Watts' drum parts when I'm 71. I can't play Neil Pierce's drum parts when I'm 71. There's an idea that rock and roll musicians drink from the fountain of youth. Like anyone else, age has a hand on the pen that writes the story. As their year away from the stage came to a close, Getty, Alex, and Neil gathered to face their musical mortality. 
In November of, of that year, we all got together in Toronto, and I was quite prepared to say, guys, I'm, you know, I'm not sorry, but I'm done. He was very much considering that maybe it was time he packed it in in terms of live shows. And it's not like you just get new members in a band and, and go for it. Russia's never been like that, and we could never, ever do something like that. We've always said that if the three of us aren't on board, we don't do a thing. And there have been other decisions in our career where the three of us weren't on board and we didn't do it. Now, nothing as profound as ending our touring life, but fair enough. So one guy doesn't want to do that thing anymore that I love to do. That hurts, but there's nothing I can do about it, and that's part of the agreement. And I realized I was kind of solitary a misfit in that context of being the one that wanted to pull that plug. I'd left one little window open in my mind, really, that if anybody said they wanted to do it one more time, I didn't know if they'd be able to. It wasn't until we had the conversations that we had that I started to think about the end and and wringing that the, the towel dry. You know, it's easy to blame everything on the drummer not wanting to go back out on the road, but there's other factors at play here that can't be ignored. And, and one of those factors is Alex's arthritis, which is a bit of a ticking time bomb. So the bastard pulled that exact card. Alex said, well, he had the arthritis in that, and uh, said, you know, I'd, I'd like, really like to do it one more time, and I don't know if I'll be able to. And then that night in my hotel room, I had the worst attack of Tourette's you have ever heard. It was a trap, you know, stomping around and cursing and swearing. <laughs> But by the next day, it is what it is. Deal with it. We talked about ways of doing a retrospective. Yeah, it's just supposed to be hands on chairs, right? Yeah. No, yours is, Alex is on a chair, yours is standing. And the idea came up, well, what if we started with modern day, the band as we are, and just went back in time until we ended the way we began, playing high schools. got very ambitious very quickly, which suited me fine. And Howard's got lighting that's you know, very basic. When the song started, you guys were silhouette against the red curtain. Cool. Yeah. You got the double yeah. going. It's a lot to put on a rush tour. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours. It's not like every tour of the sets gets shorter. It, there's none of those things that they have done that most aging bands do. This is designed to be an endurance test. They've made it this way. This is what they like to do. Well, the next day there's going to be a whole lot of YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 everything will be on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, you guys go play. Go do a concert. Yeah. All the way down here from Kitchener. See them on opening night in Tulsa? Yeah, I've been a fan since seventh grade, and uh, and I like to see five or six a tour. Woo! Is this two generations? Is yes, this father yeah. and son? Yeah. So it's his fault that you're a rusher. Yeah. Oh, I, thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, I am a musician. I'm a guitar player, um, and uh, you can you can feel the sincerity um, and the honesty and the truth, the genuineness. What are you expecting to see this evening or hear? I am totally a blank slate. I have no idea. I've stayed away from trying to sniff it out on the web. I want to be totally surprised. I'm super excited. I'm not sure what to expect. I mean, one time they got washing machines, next time they got a popcorn machine. Like, who knows what they're going to really do? Come on, baby, open it night! Our 40!
so much, Tulsa. We so appreciate it. And we'll hope to see you again sometime. Take care, bye-bye. It was show number 27 for me. I flew here from Chicago. I couldn't have been more blown away. Amazing. What was the highlight for you? Um, I would say when they stripped it down to like the high school level and Getty was talking about Alex, like, hey, here's our new electric guitarist, Alex Lifeson. It was awesome. When they started bringing out the washer elements right. and they replaced the, the, the back line with the washer elements, I knew, oh, no, I didn't see what's going on. It was fantastic. The greatest concert that I've ever seen Rush put on, and this I'm is like die, number baby. 42 for me. I can die right now. <laughs> I can die right now. This is one of the best concerts I've been to in my life tonight. I had so many things firing in my head during the whole cacophony of whatever that was I just experienced. They kind of gently, in their own Canadian way, warned us. Because <laughs> it would be an act of violence to just come out and say, after this tour, we're done. <laughs> it's not very Canadian. But, but, but this could be it. This could be it. The band's traveling circus is shadowed by another. RushCon. Misfits of the rock and roll world who ask themselves, would this be the last time they would gather to celebrate the band of their lives? I proposed to a, a group of online friends, Rush fans, said we should do a convention. And we should go to Toronto, see all the Toronto Rush sites, and uh, have some fun. And you're going to step over to the table and grab a raffle ticket and a game. Awesome, welcome. RushCon is, in essence, a fan club that meets once a year in a place. So you get all these Rush fans from everywhere meeting in one place. Usually we try to time it around a concert or some cool event, but really it just gets people out of their parents' basement. <laughs> My fandom, especially in college, um, was such a fever pitch. I was just vibrating with Rush fandom. Like, I could not get enough. And this was way, this was before Facebook and before the internet. So, like, this was me cutting out photos from magazines and, like, covering my walls. And it just got, it just got exhausting. I loved them so much, and I was so heavily inspired by everything that it's my outlet for my crazy. Show some respect for the book everyone. We have a bunch of games, like game show style stuff, and then we have a big charity auction where you can bid on signed, you know, photos and posters and stuff. Here's, like, here's the thing. We need to jump in a cab right now because you guys are meeting the band You rarely will find someone who used to be the high school quarterback to be a Rush fan, or the head cheerleader is rarely a Rush fan. But the band geek that you knew in high school or the guy that was super good at science is probably a Rush fan. <laughs> so we're, we're a very smart, artistic, and intelligent bunch, I would say. But with that comes maybe some social awkwardness, <laughs> which I definitely suffer from myself. Also, Martin's being a weenus, and he needs to leave by 5.30. So if you need to hang out with Martin Popoff and get books and get stuff signed, he will see you over at his little booth over there. Cool. I was in advertising for most of my life, and I lived in Chicago at the time. And I decided one day that I could no longer make tampon ads. Like, I was just, I could not stay in advertising. It was just crushing my soul. So I stopped going to work. I joined the 2012 Obama campaign, and it was amazing, and we won, and then I got the job at the White House. Every day, I'm just like, how do they keep letting me in this building? I think everyone has their secret obsession, and so everyone can kind of be sympathetic when I have to say, like, yes, I run a fan club and I need to take off work to do it. But yeah, it's awesome how supportive people are and how fascinating they think this whole thing is. I am Daddy Lee, and I will sing whatever there is I will. Just start.
start the song again and this time do it right. Bang! And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three, a one, two, three. such a likable feature of the band is that like they're super proud of who they are and they've never apologized for who they are. And I think that sort of inspires us as the fans to, you know, kind of be okay with who we are too. There are ways in which Rush are kind of like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> And there are a lot of ways in which they are nothing like the Grateful Dead, but their shows and their tours have a similar thing, which is just they are for the hardcores, essentially. Um, they bond, the shows bond them to the fans. They've kept us going. They've given me the life I have. They've allowed the three of us the freedom to be confident in our own way of doing things. You know, a lot of people say, well, pat us on the back for not compromising and this. Well, it, we couldn't do that if our fan base wasn't there for us. They've given us the freedom to be us. Exit the warrior to Jay's Tom Sawyer. shared this lifetime of evolution and a lot of our fans go back decades and they're bringing their kids there now and you know there's there is a shared thing with with uh, what that they passed out to their kids too of appreciating what we're doing right um, and that's important in terms of the of the example set and in terms also of the sense of resolution is the fact that yes okay we all got here together I've been out at brunch with friends and someone walks in with a rush shirt and I'm like guys, sorry, I have to go talk to someone that I've never met. Like, I have to go talk to someone wearing a Rush shirt at a restaurant. It's just what you do. The second you have that acknowledgement of, oh, we're in the secret society together, it's, oh, how many shows have you seen? Where have you seen him? Favorite album? Like, there's just so many levels on which you're just automatically connected to someone. The people that are Rush fans, this is their favorite band. There's a bunch of them. This is their band. They don't care about anybody else. I could tell you the first five rows tomorrow night that I've seen these people at 100 shows. It's, it, it, there's nothing really like it. Tonight is my 75th concert scene, Rush. I saw them first in 1974 when they were an opening act, opening for Nazareth and Rory Gallagher, and I've seen every tour since. <laughs> 121 for me, and eight for Emma. Yeah, eight, okay. So I'm pretty sure this is number 31, and okay. it's front row bucket list. I'm like 90 some shows. 90 some shows. Yeah, but I did 37 on Clock of Angels. I lose track from time to time, but I think after tonight it's about uh, no, number 170. Well, I know exactly, 158 tonight. My first Rush concert was uh, actually Grace Under Pressure. My father decided to take my passion seriously and bought a couple tickets. And uh, so he and I went together, and I think I stood screaming the entire show. Hey! He sat fairly bored the whole time. And then as, a, as I realized uh, later in life, uh, because of the certain smells in the arena, I think my father got stoned at the concert, and I've never seen him that way. And on the way home, he really didn't say much. 
on the car, except, wow, those three guys certainly made a lot of noise. As a young person, that power drew me more and more into wanting to be in dance. It definitely stuck with me. I'm a fan of Rush, and somehow Wynn got to ownership that, you know, Randy plays the drums, not really. They had a ceremony this year at the ballpark with the Arizona Diamondbacks where they retired my number. Please welcome starting pitcher number 51, Randy Johnson. I'm told, well, now you need to go unveil this big, huge box about the size of a garage door. I pulled off one of the black sheets. It was the gold-plated R30 drum kit. Randy, who is a fan of rock music, particularly the band Rush, is being presented this collector drum set, an exact replica of the one used by Neil Peart on Rush's 30th anniversary tour. Only 30 kits were ever produced and featured maple drums with gold-plated hardware. We got behind it, did a little drum fill for the fans. It's much like going to the Baseball Hall of Fame and looking at a glove that, you know, someone used back in the 50s or 60s. It's just it's something cool to look at. I just think if I could play the drums, think about the noise I could make on this thing. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> That's the most rush I know right there. There's something about the music and the iconography of Rush that certainly attracts and invites that sort of uh, geeky, for lack of a better word, attention. The musicians in Rush are so detail-oriented, it invites that sort of detail-oriented um, appreciation. So I think it's a, possibly a, you know, a circle of geekdom going on here. I'm a husband and I'm a father first. But second on that list, I'm a Rush fan. It's how I define myself. I think that's the difference between someone who's just a fan and behavior of fanaticism is putting those feelings into action. It was the MTV airing of the Exit Stage Left concert video it was the first time that they had my attention. And then I started to do the work on my own of saying, okay, well, let me listen to some of these albums that you have. How many more albums do they have? Well, I need to get all of them. Each of the folders in here are labeled appropriately, beginning from folder number one, 1974, up to 2015, in order from January through December. Full length feature articles in the band from 1979. Look at this spectacular ad. Rush Tour of the Hemispheres from Sounds Magazine, dated April 1979. Spectacularly majestic. I had reached a point in my fanaticism where I wanted to start to reach out. And I just wanted to know who else is out there? So I placed an ad in Circus Magazine in July of 1985. I anticipated getting correspondence, but not to the level that I was getting. So that's when I decided, well, I want to let them know what I have. Maybe we can trade. Maybe I have something that I can trade with them. Maybe they have something that they could trade with me. So I sat down and did a handwritten version of my rush list, and I would copy it and send them to these people. I've still maintained that list. That innocent handwritten list in 1985 has become this 91-page beast that still chronicles my entire collection. All of this is all Rush content. Enough nonsense to make the band members themselves clearly just cringe. 
here are the Indonesian cassette releases that are on my list. They're not much cooler than these. I'm not sure that my sister knows that I still have her copy of 2112 on 8-track. I promise I'll give it back. Rush the Illustrated History by Martin Popoff. I was contacted by Martin once my beloved list had ended up in Martin's hands. Martin called me on the phone and said, uh, Ray, I've been sent a copy of this list of yours. Do you really have all of this? Flip to any random page in the book. Uh, here are the the Ray Wozniak collection. I just like how pompous that sounds, quite frankly. I never think that I need a reminder of the role that they have played in my life. But still, here on this tour, this adolescent enthusiasm that I still feel is testament enough to me that all these years of pledging my allegiance to them has been worth it. Because here I am now in 2015, still being this enthused by them, They've never let me down. Maybe because they continue to feed me with just such positive energy, I don't want to let them down. The least I can do is continue to carry their flag and spread the word and share it with others. They have a cult following. It's pretty hardcore. You don't take a shot at this band. It gets very, very personal. Remember the Rock Roll Hall of Fame? I remember I went to play golf. I'm driving along the lake front of Cleveland back to the hotel and into the arena, and the Rock Hall's right there. And there's 200 Rush fans out front protesting because they haven't been inducted in the Rock Roll Hall of Fame. I can't stop thinking big. I can't stop thinking. What are the two things that the cognoscenti of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or Rolling Stone magazine, which are one and the same, hate the most? They hate progressive rock, they hate heavy metal. Well, Rush invented progressive metal. They're both. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, John Oh, that moment at the Ann Winner's induction speech tells everything you need to know about Rush fans. From Seattle, the first ladies of rock and roll and their backup man, Hart. The man with the mightiest touch, the maestro, Quincy Jones. If you were in that room, you understood what our music means to them and what they mean to us in one incredible reaction that I'll never forget. And from Toronto. I'm not, I'm just, I'm just not going to tell you who they are. You guess. The godfather of progressive metal, the high priest of high concept, Rush. From day one, the band built its following the right way. No hype, no bullshit. They did it from the ground up. Without any help from the mainstream press. <coughs> Rolling Stone. <coughs> It is our honor to finally <laughs> induct Rush into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame.
It was impressive. These guys put us in the Hall of Fame. And they were celebrating their moment. And I still get choked up when I think about it. Halfway through the tour, the band returns home to a hero's welcome, responding with one of their best performances. Hello, Toronto, my hometown. I think the goal for any band is to have that magical night. It probably happens for a moment here and there, but some nights it's just like it clicks in. You're not even in control of it. You just play, and every strum on the guitar you feel with the kick at the same time or the snare. And, you know, it's a, it's a magical experience. There were probably more of those shows on this tour than, than I can recall. The Friday show was one of those nights. We were in sync. Everybody played right in the pocket. The thing kind of took on a life of its own. And uh, I, yeah, I remember after each song, I do a little kind of status check. Oh, well, that was a good one. Well, that was a good one. That was, it kept coming. I kept ch checking them all off. Because that we knew the show so intimately in passages like in, in Jacob's Ladder and that, where that's what I found. Suddenly I was going deeper in it. And yes, the, the unison quality of all three of us taking that um, does become a breathing entity. still have a part of your brain that's free to kind of float away from the moment and appreciate what the audience is doing, what your partners are doing, the context of your moment, like where am I, what am I doing in the middle of this thing and I'm playing all this crazy shit at the same time. So it's a pretty sublime state and I find it such a challenge and such a reward when you hit that golden feeling, that kind of perfect feeling, that it becomes a bit addictive. It's a very complicated thing, playing a show. There are a lot of notes in three hours of music. And to play them all in sync and correctly is a challenge. As a performer, I think that's the goal. I mean, you want every gig to be that gig. But you know it took months to get it to that point. Frankly, that's a reward. That's the moment you're going, this is awesome. This is payback for all the work.
us for over 40 years. We so appreciate it. And we hope maybe one day we'll meet again. Thank you so much. No, it is not nope. my first Rush show. In fact, it's probably like my 30th Rush show. Uh, and 111th show. Oh, oh, what? I <laughs> said 30, he said 111. 111th show. He like won immediately. I think it's about 75 shows or so I've been to so far. That's my estimate, yes. Tonight is my 69th show, and then Los Angeles will be my 70th show, and hopefully not my last Rush show. Literally could not have gone better. Almost everything was completely sold out. We've never been in that position for, for their uh, career. You know, we've had little pockets, nights here and there, but to, to have a run that was so consistent, even people that you wouldn't necessarily consider fans, other professionals who couldn't wait to get in to see the show. It's a dream. We could put 20 more shows on sale and I know what the outcome's gonna be. You seldom know what the outcome's gonna be in this business. You have a general idea, you know you're gonna be successful, but not to this level. I think if they did 20 more shows, they would be, 18 of the 20 would be sellouts. So count me in, I'd love to do it. I know that if there is more, there's not a lot more. Ray is our manager. We can't get rid of him. Since April of 1969, I was 16, and uh, I think Alex and Getty were 15 when we started out. Well, Ray began his life as a cheap kind of seller of fake pot. Uh, and then he decided, hmm, maybe it's better to be a booking agent. So when he started handling us, he was really an agent. Yeah, all the murderer jobs were taken. <laughs> I quit high school, I had a little talent agency, I was promoting a couple small shows, just trying to find a way to, to survive and, and be in the music business. One of his first and most profound acts as the manager of Rush was to have me thrown out of the band. Isn't that great? I fired Getty. Uh, Getty remembers this, I don't remember this. <laughs> and then he ironed his hair <laughs> to celebrate. Yeah. I don't remember this. It's folklore to me. <laughs> That's, That's why I love him to this day. Yeah. Well, obviously we reversed it real quick or we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> okay, you guys, start moving towards, stay upstage, now move towards on stage. Well, you're gonna have to see the map as to see where we are. 
one of my tenets of life is, what's the most excellent thing I can do today? I'm gonna find a nice way up through Idaho, which is some of the nicest riding in the country, never mind just in the West. Motorcycle riding is, to him, tied into as being part of the tour. 18 to 20,000 miles on his motorcycle in between shows. <laughs> It's very important that he feel like his life is bigger than just stopping at the venues and doing a show. That his life is ongoing and still a kind of adventure apart from work. I got sea spray. So now we're gonna go look closer at Idaho. And then I've got a bigger time and distance and I'm gonna arrive in the national park so I don't wanna be too late. I'll look up the mileage, another thing I do because Ideally, I have the bus drive after the show for about three hours and then park in the Chateau Walmart that we choose to park in because they welcome overnight campers. When you get on this highway at the beginning, you see, warning, 75 miles of winding road ahead. Ooh, to a motorcyclist, this is a promise, not a threat. His thing was, that's the part of my day I enjoy the most, is being on my bike. If you take that away from me, I really won't want to do this. And I can see lots of interesting roads here. Dotted lines are unpaved ones. We like that. So this is all beautiful, beautiful riding here. Lolo Pass, I know that from previous tours. A lot of challenging roads, and certainly there was fear <laughs> and danger and all of that. But it, on the other hand, peaceful and serene. I was on my motorcycle from Sandusky, Ohio, down to Bloomington, Indiana for the day, then back up to Chicago for the next show. And that day, I was thinking, riding through the country roads of Indiana, probably uh, in the rest of my life, there won't be another day when the best thing I can do is plot a back road route from Sandusky, Ohio, to Bloomington, Indiana. So appreciate it a little more. Whatever your weakest point is, that level of exhaustion is going to attack. Starting in my 20s, my teeth would give me trouble. Other tours, it with ear infections all over the place. I had tendonitis in one elbow, one tour. You know, it's gonna attack you somewhere. But of all the things I worried about before this tour, and I worried about my elbows, and I worried about cardiac, cardiac arrest, I did not worry about the bottoms of my feet. They'd been riding a lot in rain, his boots were wet. It was just torrential rain, it was brutal. Neil's security guy, who rides with him, came up to me and he said, he's killing me. We just rode for nine hours. I'm 16 years younger. I can't keep up with him, and I don't have to play tonight. And he developed, basically developed a fungus on his feet. And then that grew into eczema, psoriasis, bacterial infections, and all that. I applied one type of ointment to it that only worsened the situation. But the recovery period just took an eternity. I assumed it would go away and he'd be all right. Yeah, but and he's such a stoic guy. He, I can't believe that he played through that yeah. anyways. I mean, there was about two weeks of utter hell for him, like really utter hell. I mean, he really could barely walk for uh, a couple of show period. By the end of the second leg, I was walking on two raw stumps. So drumming, of course, was agonizing. Because then, roughly at the same time, his hands started cracking open as well. You know, if you looked at his hands, it's a mess of calluses and blisters and cuts. And what drummer needs hands and feet? But uh, that's what he had to persevere through.
Actually, one moment before a second set, and I was standing on the stage as we were able to do because of the front uh, Austrian curtain, right? And I was standing and looking around at everybody in the place having such a good time, except me. I was like, yeah, I'm suffering here and I don't want to do this, but I'm going to. Just like he didn't want to add more shows, he wasn't going to back out of the ones that he had. He's played with tendonitis. He's played with horrible pain in his hands. Flu. Yeah. He never tells you when he's sick, ever. Whereas we tell everybody we're sick whenever yeah, immediately. we're immediately. You know. Especially me, immediately. Yeah. Alert the nation. I have a cold. <laughs> Alex and I joked one night when I wasn't feeling well and I had this thing going through, what if I have a heart attack and die right here and wreck the show? And Alex laughed and said, oh, whatever you do, don't wreck the show. And, I said, and it felt like that. That was the ultimate terribleness. Not that I was going to die of a heart attack, but I was going to wreck the show. If the sniper had been in the building and shot him in the shoulder, he would have finished the fucking set. That's what makes a professional, right? There's no way you go up on stage with your frailties. There's no way you go up on there with your regrets or your resentments or anything. Every night, bring that commitment. My age, you kind of evolved with the band. But there's obviously songs which mean an awful lot to me while I was in the hospital. Everyday Glory, just rising up and being able to do stuff again. In the house where nobody laughs and nobody speaks. The, the one that perhaps says the most is Rise from Where You've Been, from the Ashes. It sounds awfully dramatic, but um, you know, I was dead. Unfortunately, um, I was in a fatal road traffic accident on the 1st of August, 1998, and my friend who was driving, he, 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 he died. Um, I was very badly injured. Um, we were coming back from a, a football game. I woke up five days later in Dundee in intensive care. Shattered both my legs. I fractured my back in four places. I punched a spinal cord down at L3, what they call, um, and I, I was on fire, <laughs> and, I, and, and I actually drowned but I would spend nearly six months away from my family and friends. So I, I spent long days and afternoons and nights alone in the ward um, while everyone else is not there. So what's going to inspire you then? You listen to music, that's what inspires you. And of course I listened to Rush. They told me I would never walk again, very early on. Um, and you just think, you know what, yes I am. I had to get feeling back in my legs. I started going to the gym, getting out of bed then, and participating with the rest of the guys who were there. It's so intense because you're just in this environment. It's all about getting better. You know, so everyday glory, it really became some sort of bond. The last show I'm seeing is the 1st of August, um, which is the end of the tour in LA. And that's the same date as my injury when I had the accident. So I think that might be quite an emotional evening. As the tour winds down, from a distance, one wonders, will there ever be a relationship between a band and a fan base that is so long-standing and powerful? So many lives wrapped up in the work of three musicians.
the tours have been utterly essential to sustaining the band. Because they weren't chasing hits, they were counting on building something. They were in it for the long haul. It was always a marathon, not a sprint. My uncle has a country place that no one knows about. He's just a little boy from that Rush came of age, so to speak, in the 70s and were on the road uh, as much as they were, I think was very significant as, as far as them cementing a relationship with their, with their fans. The obsession grew after I saw them. The obsession just never stopped. So 26 years later, 45th show, I was 16. <laughs> People would see them and get really excited because they, bottom line, they play really well. You know, whether you like them or don't like them, you go see a show and you walk out going, yeah, they're good. I've dragged a lot of guys to these concerts and every time they come back hooked because of the live performance. Touring is the same thing to Rush today that it was in the early days. That never changed, which is if, if you tour and you go to people, you'll get a reaction. You toured to sell records, right? And you only broke an, on reputation by being a live act, and, and that's where they sold their oats. I can remember in the 80s where Rush could go to the UK and sell 100,000 or 200,000 tickets, but they couldn't sell that many records. A record's what? 20 bucks, the tickets 100 bucks? Just doesn't make any sense. To come and see them live is an opportunity to get something that you cannot purchase other than the ticket price. You cannot, you cannot, you can even watch a video of them, but it's not the same as when you see them live it, 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 it resonates in your body and it stays with you for, for days, years, months, whatever. Let's remember that Rush did not break until the fourth record, 2112. Think about other groups too from the 70s. Now that I think about like how many records did, uh, you know, did Journey have before they kind of broke it? They had all the, the early ones. Styx was another one, REO Speedwagon. I mean, a bunch of these other groups from the 70s. I mean, there, there are a lot of albums there where they were really kind of developing it. Fast forward to today, so how many labels were going to be able to stand behind an artist and like, okay, you know, you're developing your craft. We're going to do four records with you, five records. And it takes those few albums to get to the place where they can start to think about headlining an arena. What you're seeing more of is like, if it doesn't work on the first time, you know, that's it. And how long have you been a Rush fan? Uh, 1975. And I'm, I'll tell you how old I am, I'm 58 years old, so it's uh, been a while. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to be looking at 40-year at careers, other than a tiny percentage of acts and, and, and maybe none. It's just a, a different world, you know?
Brees, I was uh, a pretty convincing guy. And everybody just presumed that he'd be able to talk Neil into an extension. Everybody was hoping that up until the last leg. And I think that's when reality started setting in that there was no way it was going to go on. So uh, you could see the mood changing uh, inside the band and inside the crew. That makes it hard that we're not doing more. We're not taking this to Europe. That we're not doing another 20 shows in America. But the other side of that coin was we almost had nothing. So 35 is a lot bigger than zero. When we initially started planning, we were gonna be like, no, let's just do Toronto, it's fine. But then we heard LA is the last show and we like, we have to be at the last show. We have to have a presence there and do, do this group therapy thing that we do. Martin! Hey, George! How are you? Hey! Hey! <laughs> That's a yeah. you made it. <laughs> this one goes on you. Yeah, this is my, my son. Nice to meet you. George from, from, from Scotland. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's really, really cool. It's his first and probably the last one. Sadly, yeah, but you know. So if you have to leave it, we, we just wanted to leave it mm -hmm. big. In the moment, you can enjoy it. No debe ser fácil para un esposo o una esposa eh, tener un, una, una pareja que sea fan de Rush, porque cada vez que Rush sale de gira, no tenemos más límites. Nuestro presupuesto en la familia pasa a estar en peligro. Nuestra presencia en la casa pasa a estar en peligro. Simplemente Rush está on tour. Nosotros nos vamos. This is front row. Of course. You always front row. Well, not always, but I, I will tap you on the shoulder. We're second row. I try to do my best. Hay algo, una energía que hay en el ambiente que te une. Eh, y yo creo que Pocas bandas en el mundo logran eso. That will be very, very emotional for all of us. I think so. Eh, probably. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. What if it's the final Rush show of this that they play? If they knew it was the last night, if they knew this is it, never to be play live again, there'd be people sobbing in the aisles. No, we can get on 405. It's open. I've been lead driver for Rush since 1977. I had no inkling that this would last this long at all. We, we were just in it for the moment. The first venue was in Regina, Saskatchewan. I can remember that because we backed down into the venue right behind the stage and the first thing I saw was Alex jumping off the stage, getting on my truck and shaking my hand welcoming me to the tour. And I've never seen that done before or since. My girlfriend wasn't too keen about me going away for a year so I convinced her to quit her teaching job, jump in the truck with me and we went across Canada. Okay, 605 North. Yeah, to the 105 West. After about the third year touring, we were in Canada going across in the middle of the night and I was riding with the band bus and we decided we were gonna get married. And I got on the radio and told the news and the only one left up was Alex and he heard it on the radio and he had us pull over. And Alex got out with a bottle of champagne, jumped in the truck and rode with us for the next three or four hours the two of them drinking champagne until Alex passed out in the back and just shows you what, what a great guy Alex is. We're heading for the forum, the LA forum. Uh, we're gonna do the last show of the tour. 
but definitely doesn't feel like just another show. It's it's come to a conclusion, and it does it does feel like uh, the end of an era here. It was nice to be back to a building where I could remember some really, really great gigs. The audiences were great. We played really well in that building. So many other memories, peripheral memories that were attached to being in Los Angeles for those shows, all of that kind of stuff. Where'd you get the art? Did you make that? No, somebody threw them on stage. I should go back and put a question mark on there. It was an emotional day. A lot of our crew guys were very emotional. Some of our guys have worked for us a long time, years, decades. It's inconceivable to them that this, this would be it. So it was hard to keep your emotions under control. It's like a regular day. Will I feel sad later? Yes, I'll feel very sad when I have to say goodbye to my crew. I'm going to say goodbye to you, man. Oh, those guys. I'm not going to talk to them today because I'll just start crying. You know, everyone's, well, we've been such a family. And now we're going to be leaving. It's kind of like, you know, it's a poignant day. You know, all, uh, the nicest guys in rock and roll. It's a shame for us. This is it. You sense this almost dread that the end is coming. I couldn't hide from it. I, mean, I tried to hide from it. But everyone kept coming up to me saying, last day, right? <laughs> it's like, shut up. <laughs> I go into my zone, and I tried to stay there. People kept pulling me out of it, and I kept going back to it. I want to be professional to the last. It's really important for me to give the best show I can for the audience. You know, as hard as it is for Neil in his way, it's very hard for me as well. So I didn't feel I had any room for that kind of emotion. It wouldn't do me any good. People say, oh, you must be happy. There's a, just one more show. No, no, no. There's still one more show. It's still a, a major campaign to be waged here and conquered. You know, all of those things are, are what has to be inside your, your dedicated mind. You, you got work to do. And it's not easy playing rush music for three hours. I just have to do my work. I have to do my warm ups. I have to do whatever it takes for me to do and then get on stage. And that's where I feel at home. And that's where I can express myself. Dancers, loads of frantic pains and pain and desperation. Her aching limbs and downcast face will glow with perspiration. Slippers, wire and lung gone by with just the briefest pause. Flooding through a memory, the echoes of old applause. Across the floor and closes the bedroom door. There's never been anything that they've had put in front of them that they didn't do well. And he stares out the kitchen door where the sun lies the wall. These guys are so good, and yet they don't take themselves so seriously. That's a gift.
So everybody's clear on that arrangement for tonight, right? <laughs> I haven't really processed what it's going to be like for me to be at the last show. I'm just full on in planning mode. Rush on! <laughs> Maybe when the lights go on and I'm in my seat and I'm finally thinking like, oh my God, is this the last time I'm going to jump out of my seat when Getty runs on stage? Is this the last time? Then it'll start hitting me. It's just going to feel like there's a whole um, lack of like, progression in my life, you know, to have this thing stop that I used to look forward to so much. This is so important to me and has been such a part of who I've been for so long <laughs> that, you know, closing this chapter is going to be sad, but good. <laughs> I'm sort of in denial on the whole thing. I think once I experience it, it'll I'll have to let it go, you know? like what's it gonna be like for us to be at that last show, but I'm dying to know what it's going to be like for them. And to be like, yeah, we've been doing this for 40 years and now that path is sort of winding down. That must be extremely heavy on them. Shh, we're watching Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for deals. <laughs> We're coming up on uh, five minutes. There won't be any more holes. Well, that's what you always say. This is a painting that my uh, my grandson did when he was four. We put it on the floor, we gave him all these paints, and we said, do whatever you want, use brushes, use your fingers, use your hands, and uh, it's amazing. And there's his brothers, you know, it's typical of, of a kid, you know, happy, smiling, sea life. Whereas this is dark and brooding. Walking up to that stage, it's like, oh, so much can go wrong. 
any musician knows, live performance is the ultimate chaos theory. Uh, there are things that happen you don't even know enough to worry about. So I worry. Song. Okay, got through that one. Oh, not this one now. And there's a whole monologue going on in my head all the way through. Coaching myself, that's really what it is. great show that last show and I tried to absorb as much as I could the building the crowd the lights I tried to be acutely aware of everything that was going on and the crowd was unbelievable I looked out and I saw signs from all over the globe that made me feel good that so many people had come from so far away all those places that I knew we couldn't get to really has been a brotherhood, a very, very deep friendship within the band. Neil especially was really, he knew it was the end for him, so he gave it his all. And he did goofy things at the end of the night behind his kit to crack us up. I love those guys. They've been my closest friends and family for, you know, four decades. To work together with the same guys for four decades, to our mutual satisfaction in every way, you can't beat that, you can't repeat that. time that song but some nights it's longer than others and it was probably the longest of the tour on that night <laughs> that was part of us it just didn't want to give it up early on to add 16 bars of a song from before 74, right? So we're not going back just to 74. We went back a song that was never recorded, those 16 bars. I think it's Garden Road or Fancy Dancer. I get those mixed up. But I kept forgetting. And I'd get up and walk away in rehearsal. I even did it in one of the shows. So uh, Alex happened to mention, oh, I love when you do that. So I got an idea. So each night I'd try to do something different in that part of the show. And so yeah, that night I had it in mind. I think I'd ready, you know, I'm gonna photograph this audience of all audiences. Once I was up, oh, gotta get a picture of the guys at work, right? Thought it was perfect. The closest I came to losing it emotionally was when I was saying goodnight. I got choked up and uh, I got momentarily overcome. Thank you so much, Los Angeles. On behalf of the greatest crew and organization in the world. And then Neil touched me on the shoulder, which totally uh, 
surprised me. All through the tour, certain parties had been asking me to go out front and take a bow. And I just have never crossed that. I call it the backline meridian. I stay behind my drums and cymbals for 40 years. Never go out front, never. It's not my territory. And meanwhile, I thought, well, it'd be really cool if I did, but I can't. So eventually I talked myself into it, but I wouldn't tell anybody because it was up to me to um, screw my courage to the sticking place, right, and, and go out and do it. I had managed Van Halen for eight years where they did that every night. They fucking hated each other. Some of them hated each other. But they would do it and it was scripted. This wasn't scripted. Thank you so much, Los Angeles. On behalf of the greatest crew and organization in the world. Whoa, what a surprise. So it was totally the right thing to do. I went out there, it was a big smiling, beautiful photographs of the moment, and it's so funny, the backline meridian. On behalf of our whole organization, thank you, United States of America, for 40 awesome years. And I do hope we'll meet again sometime. Bye-bye. It's really sad that it was the last one and that it was going to end. And I know down the road, I'll, I'll feel fine with it. But I still lament the fact that it's likely that we won't be doing a major tour anymore. In this one of many possible worlds All for the best Or something's our test It is what it is Spinning, spinning round 